Today we have Jamie Kurtz. Can you tell? Um, he's from Indianapolis, not too far away from here. Um, he's at Fusion Alliance, and he heads a team of 35 members, and he's an app developer. That's pretty cool. Uh, does architecture security assessment. Um, he's done service level programming for about 10 years. And along with all of this, he also wrote a book. That sounds like an awful lot, and I'm sure that he probably didn't have a whole lot of spare time when that happened. Uh, but he's going to talk to us about the contents of the book and some of the things that he knows quite a bit about, which is the idea of Web API. And I'm excited about this because it's a newer technology. It's one that personally I'm hoping we start adopting where I'm working. And it's, it's one that I think that's very relevant today in terms of switching over potentially in terms of how we do web-based and in some cases our APIs in terms of sharing between systems. So, give a hand for Jamie. Thanks, Mark. Good. So, um, there's a concert going on over here. And I, I must admit, I had to Google Bush. I don't know if that makes me old or young or what, but I still don't know who they are. Is there any Bush fans in here? You're in the wrong room. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> are, are you missing a good show? I, I don't know. <laughs> They're kind of old. Okay, good. All right, well, as uh, Mark mentioned, um, I run a team of about 35 developers for Fusion Alliance, a consulting company over in um, Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I, my, my group is called the AppDev Group. It used to be called the Microsoft Group, um, but I've changed the name because we do a lot more than just Microsoft technologies. Um, I have a lot of uh, open source developers working for me, Ruby on Rails guys, PHP. We're getting into some NoSQL stuff. I've got a guy working on NoSQL at a big company. I'm sorry, uh, Cassandra on, on which is a NoSQL technology uh, at a big pharmaceutical company. Um, so that's kind of what I do during the day, and at night I write books and write open source software. So um, I've been doing, as you mentioned, uh, actually a little over 15 years of development, um, mostly on the back end. So I'm a DBA, a SQL Server DBA for a while, then a lot of service programming and security related uh, services type stuff. Um, so now I do more, mostly architecture. Um, Keith, you and I were talking about patterns. Um, that's one of my big pushes with, with my own team as patterns and practices and kind of the fundamentals. Um, and then I get involved in like architecture assessments and IT assessments and that kind of thing. So um, I have a big passion for services, um, connecting systems, um, letting you know client server talk in the most kind of streamlined and non-ceremonious way, if you will. So um, yeah, so I, um, I approached um, APRESS about a year ago and I said, hey, I'd love to write a web API book. And they were looking for somebody to do such a book. The problem was there's not a lot to the web API. Has anybody here looked at it yet? Hey, good. Maybe this will all go really fast. Maybe some, a little bit? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Has anybody written uh, REST services with anything else that's not web API? Yeah, well, like on what technology? Just WCF, WCF? yeah. Java, yeah. Um, has anybody written any REST services with uh, MVC? Okay, so this, this is gonna be similar to that. And then I kind of outlined that in the book. but. The one thing I noticed after I did all the research on Web API and started working on the book was there wasn't much there. In fact, if you read the book, it's only like 120 some pages, um, and APRESS wanted to keep it down to 100 pages, there's really not a lot of Web API content. I mean, there's some in there, a couple chapters worth, but most of it is kind of background about REST, setting up a solution, and really working with APRESS, we decided that the best thing to do was gonna be to take a brisk walk down the happy path of creating um, a full service on the web API because there's a lot of people out there that um, you throw a new technology out, they don't know how to do, do the fundamentals. And so we wanted to talk about REST, and we wanted to talk about how to wire up like dependency injection and get a logger set up. And some people will say, hey, I know how to do logging, that's great. There's a lot of people, I'm on my team of 35, I would say most of them don't know how to properly set up log for net. And so anyway, that was kind of my target audience was like, hey, let's just go from zero to kind of the happy path canonical solution very quickly. And so you can read it in a couple nights or at least a weekend. So that's what I'm gonna discuss here. We talk about REST, talk about Web API, and um, yeah, let's get, let's get started. So uh, what is REST? Um, gotta start out with the happy kittens. Did you know, I, saw, I heard the other day that uh, most content on YouTube is kittens, believe it or not. <laughs> Even above like porn and stuff. So I thought I'd throw some, <laughs> or maybe those are the same thing, I don't know. But I thought I'd uh, throw some kittens up there. So this is REST. <laughs> as is this. This is the uh, drunken kitty uh, passed out on the radiator. I thought that was kind of funny. My wife showed me these pictures. Okay, so seriously, what is REST? So REST stands for Representational State Transfer. 
So you probably ask, what, what the heck is that, right? So that's, keep in mind that REST itself was, was created by Roy Fielding as he was working on his uh, PhD dissertation back in 2000. So when you go read the contents or the, the REST portion of his dissertation, it kind of makes your head spin. You've got to read it several times over. Has anybody read it in here? Okay, it's actually a good read, if you, about the 10th, 11th time through it. Um, but it, it, so I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I kind of tried to translate it. So basically you're using one or more representations of data to view the state of a thing. The thing we were talking about is going to be on the web, right? And uh, secondly, secondly, you can um, alter the state of that thing using representations. So representations would be anything of the form of like HTML, XML, JSON, web, or not web forms, but HTML forms and the like and any other kind of data. And we'll talk a little bit about collection JSON, which is a new media type out there. Um, so it's really intended to help with seeing a well-architected application. I put seeing in quotes, because really what it is, is helps you think of um, a good architecture. So if anybody in here is interested in architecture, REST is really meant to describe a well-architected well -architected web solution. All right? um, and it sort of treats the web as a whole as a giant state machine. Um, and we'll get into some details here. Um, in terms of timing, like obviously the web has been around for, what is it, 20 some years or, or longer. Um, Roy Fielding came up with the REST uh, constraints and guidelines in about 2000. That was part of his PhD. So it's actually been around for a while. And if you, if you Google REST, you'll see things going back to right around 2006, 2007. It started kind of picking up some speed, mostly in the Java community. Um, and then obviously with the web API, it's kind of transitioning over to the .NET community now. Um, yeah, so why did we come up with REST on HTTP? So there was a desire to leverage more of the HTTP stack. So if you've ever done anything with um, SOAP, like on WCF, um, you're not really utilizing HTTP. There's a lot of other stuff in there. It's like they said, okay, yes, that's, HTTP is fine, but we're going to invent a whole other set of things and a set of um, uh, concerns that we're going to utilize to do messaging. And so REST is a, a way of Roy Fielding saying, hey, wait a minute, like we already have HTTP. It already addresses things like security and addressability and discoverability and caching. Like, why don't we use that? Again, why, don't, why reinvent something that's, that's already out there? Um, and third, services should be readable, right? That, that, was, that was one of Roy Fielding's um, premises, that when you look at a service endpoint, you should be able to tell what it is. You shouldn't get back uh, like a big SOAP message and you're trying to disseminate what this big thing is, right? Is that, what? Okay, <laughs> if you've done SOAP messaging before, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a royal pain in the you-know-what, especially if you're coming from a, like a JavaScript client, and there are SOAP libraries, but it's still a pain in the neck. And then, you know, if you call a REST service with a JavaScript, like an AJAX call, it's hugely easier uh, with REST, which is one of the points. So um, another point was for, for consistency and standards. We already have HTTP, we already have the web. Again, let's, let's leverage that, and then let's make all service calls look the same. And as we'll talk here in a little bit, um, even kind of the method names, the way services look, is, is meant to be more standardized and consistent across all the different domains. So what Royal Fielding came out and said is that um, the REST constraints, uh, sorry, she so came up with a set of constraints and a set of guidelines. The constraints, uh, I think there's six of them or so, um, client and server decoupled. So whenever you do uh, SOAP, um, especially with like on the .NET, pl uh, sorry, .NET platform uh, with like the WSDL and the, and the, you know, the contracts and the proxies, the client and the server are very much coupled together. Um, and that's, that's partly on the technology itself within like .NET or the Java technology, but it's also kind of inherent in SOAP. Like they kind of have to know what's going on between the client and server. And Roy Fielding said, we don't want that. We want them to be decoupled so that the two can, can um, evolve independently. That's kind of always the goal of services, right? Like you want to be able to say, I have a service, you have a client, I'm going to change it whenever I want. But the reality is when you're dealing with SOAP, uh, it doesn't work out quite that nicely. And if you've tried to change your services, it's a royal pain in the neck. And what Roy Fielding said was like, hey, let's, let's stick with HTTP and that'll allow us to decouple. Um, statelessness, uh, from a server perspective, um, we don't want to track session state on the server. That's a big no-no when it comes to HTTP. Um, cacheable, so everything that you're doing, hmm, everything you're reading, all the resources that you're reading should be cacheable. Uh, uniform interface, and I'll, I'll get into that here in a little bit about what that actually means. Uh, layered systems, so that kind of talks about, uh, Roy, Roy Fielding is basically saying you should be able to leverage the different like network interfaces, routers, all the networking junk that's out there, um, you know, load balancers and whatnot when it comes to your service, which if you're going through um, a REST 
uh, sorry, not, if you're going through a SOAP service, you tend to bypass because SOAP doesn't leverage the HTTP protocol and all the, the networking stack in between there. I'm not sure what this last one means, other than maybe you're shipping JavaScript or something with your, with your service. I have not, I've yet to see anybody actually use that last constraint. So, any thoughts on that last one? Is anybody shipping code with their REST service? Okay. There you go. <laughs> Which, actually, okay, uh, yeah. So, an example of shipping code with your REST endpoint would be an HTML page, right? HTML actually does follow the REST constraints. These, these all apply to a website just as much as they do a service. In fact, Roy Fielding didn't intend this to be just a web API kind of a thing. It, meant, it was meant to be uh, guidance for a well-architected web application, not just a, a web API. Um, so yeah, whenever you hit um, a resource on a web server, you get back HTML and you get back JavaScript. Um, so that would be code. Um, although I would argue that usually on your REST services, you're, you're, you're not going to have you not going to be shipping code to people. I don't know. All right, so as I mentioned, um, there's four, uh, four principles there in terms of how to interface with the, uh, the service. And this is kind of where most people talk about REST. Um, one is resource identification uh, and addressability. Um, we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Second, um, being able to modify a state of a resource only through the data available for that representation. Again, we get back to a decoupling of the client and server. We don't want the client trying to update the server state knowing anything else besides what it's, what it's taken from the server, like on a, on a call. Does that make sense? So there shouldn't be any like prearranged knowledge or any like back channel knowledge of that server because that, that adds to the coupling of the client and the server. Um, third, uh, request and response messages should include everything needed for processing. Again, that goes back to the decoupling. You don't want like prearranged knowledge to exist there between the client and the server. And last, um, hypermedia as the engine of application state, or hate OS, um, which I think is probably one of the harder concepts for service developers to grasp. And in terms of technology, it's still very much evolving. Um, we'll talk about collection JSON in a minute, but there's really not a lot out there in terms of help on the, on the, on the, on the libraries. Um, Web API itself doesn't come like built in with any kind of um, hypermedia support, so you kind of have to do that on your own at this point in time. I imagine that'll, that'll show up soon. And there's some open source um, libraries out there that are kind of starting to, to kick up to help you with, with hypermedia. But basically what that says is, um, similar to when you go to a web page, right, I should be able to get to any resource within my API from the root. So when you, when you build a SOAP service, you look at the, like an endpoint of a SOAP service, right? All I see is like .svc or you know, whatever your endpoint is. And you have no idea what's behind that thing. Well, with a REST-oriented API, you should be able to go to a root, you know, API WAC or something, and then I should be able to navigate to the rest of the API with the data that's coming back from the API itself. So think of a web page, right? I go to like Microsoft.com and I can get anywhere I want after, that, after I get there. Click on links and eventually I'll hit it all. Same thing should be the case with your a well-architected RESTful API. Like the, all the resources should be available by navigating and clicking through. I'll show you an example of that here shortly. So, good. so one of the concepts I, I talked about in the book was how to go from RPC or so kind of to REST. I mean, I think we're all fairly used to RPC style development, um, not only from a services standpoint, but um, that's kind of how we do object-oriented programming. I think we think of like classes and then we think of methods on those classes and that's kind of how we think. And so I thought it'd be a good exercise to go through like starting from what we know with RPC or kind of method-oriented programming and then migrate up to REST. In fact, Leonard Richardson came up with the, what, what he or other people have called the REST maturity model. So um, the first sort of tenet of this REST maturity model is you're resource-centric, not method-centric. If you've ever written a, uh, like a WCF SOAP service, it's very method-centric. Like you have a, a service endpoint, might be called like task service or account service, and then you throw like 50 methods on there and they're of varying degrees. We want to get away from that. We want to be more resource-oriented, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so we use verbs, not arbitrary methods. Just in, similar to the way that you would uh, build a class with methods on it, that's how you would do an RPC service. But we don't want to do that. We want to not create arbitrary methods. We want to use the HTTP methods, which we'll talk about. But of course, those are get, put, post, delete, those things. We want to leverage those only. And that goes back to REST being 
a model for doing um, well-architected applications, which says let's leverage our HTTP, which only has a certain set of uh, methods. We don't just make up methods, we use those. Um, and third, as we talked about, hypermedia discoverability, not, not a contract, right? I shouldn't publish WSDL and then bind you to that. I should just be able to give you a root URL and I can change it whenever the hell I want and you're gonna discover it the next time you click on that URL. When I go to, again to go to Microsoft.com, I don't have an agreed upon structure for their website. Like I, I'm not gonna like pin them to the wall and say, hey, you moved this page. Like it's up to them at any time they wanna move it. But I can discover it by clicking through and that's the idea behind REST as opposed to RPC. There's no contract, there's no WSDL that says, hey, this is how my entire surface is gonna look. You don't have that with REST. You say, I'm gonna change it whenever I want. You gotta go find your stuff. So this is kind of a, a picture of what it would look like if you were gonna treat it as a maturity model. We're down here, we have, can, I, can you see, see this, see that back there? Good enough? Okay. If you can, I have that in here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so at level zero, or I guess no maturity, or no, no restfulness, restlessness maybe, um, we have RPC soap, so there's kind of one URI, like a service endpoint, and it's got a, um, a whole bunch of methods on it that are all post, right? They're all HTTP post. So then we say, okay, let's fix one of those problems, and let's use many URIs for my resources, but I'm still gonna use post methods. And we'll go up here and we'll say, okay, then let's do, keep the URIs for all my resources, unique URIs, and I'll show you an example here in a minute. But we're gonna be able to uniquely address all the resources. And let's also use the HTTP, ver HTTP verbs, not my own arbitrary method names. And then last, make it hypermedia driven, or hate OS. Hate OAS, excuse me. Um, so <clears throat> I think if you were gonna focus on anything through the book or this talk, it would be this. It would be take what you presumably know today and like deliberately walk through this and figure out what a restful service looks like. Because it's not, it's not just about like being rest because it's cool or because Roy Fielding talk about it, or Glenn Block is talking about it now, or I'm talking about it. It really is a better way to do uh, web architecture. And that was the original intent of the dissertation, was this is how you do uh, web architecture versus, versus a SOAP architecture. All right, so, <clears throat> what time is it? Good. So I'm gonna walk through, albeit quickly, uh, how to model a REST API. Again, we'll kind of start with um, what we know about RPC, and kind of object-oriented programming, and then we'll quickly get into what a REST API looks like. Uh, and then I do, of course, want to pull up a web API. <laughs> um, and then we'll, depending on how much time we have, we'll talk a little bit about database sessions. I think that's incredibly important. Of course, security. And then at the end, we'll throw in a little bit about collection JSON. So, I think that's the whole picture, yeah. So again, start with what we know. So, uh, who, who's built uh, our, our, sorry, SOAP services? Awesome, okay, so everybody knows kind of how to model that out, right? Like you have a service endpoint, uh, I have one here, task service, um, which is an exact copy out of the book. So if you've read the book, sorry, this might be kind of boring. Um, and then you create methods on that service, but they're all post. And in order to call them, the caller already needs to know what it is. Like there's no way to like discover, well, there's WSDL, but you, you bind to that WSDL and you create a proxy and you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of coupling going on. So that's kind of level zero, right? We have one endpoint, one method, and we're relying on the WSDL, but we have a lot of arbitrary methods here. So first thing we wanna do is we wanna convert our URIs to be uniquely addressable. So instead of saying, I have an endpoint and I'm gonna call like get task or get task assignees or search tasks, I'm actually gonna create URIs that point to those things. So this actually points to task number one, two, three, four. Um, this points, I think there's something missing here. That should point to the task assignees like slash users right there. Um, so we're addressing the first level, which is to use URIs. And so uh, similar to a web page where you would type in your browser, you know, da la 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 slash something dot HTML, it gets that one resource. We want, what did I just do? We want these URLs to get tasks number one, two, three, four, or if this all was here, slash users. That should be the users for task one, two, three, four. So that allows me really to go right in my browser on, on, a, on a query type in the address and I get back exactly what I'm looking for. That also, oddly enough, makes it um, discoverable by search engines, right? Because now everything is addressable via the URL. There's nothing, there's nothing hidden behind a service barrier, right? The URL defines those resources. Okay, so then the next thing we wanna do is 
start using the verbs as they're intended to be, not our own arbitrary methods. So before we do that, let me, let me talk about the, the four kind of prominent um, uh, HTTP verbs. There, there's a bunch more, but most people don't really use them. So if we divide it up between the four verbs and then either collection or single uh, elements, and I want to read through all these, but basically, well, okay, I will, quickly. Um, so a get on a collection should return all of them. Get on a single one should return that one, that's pretty obvious. Um, a put on a collection should replace the entire collection. Uh, a put on a single one should be like an upsert, right? Like either you're going to create that thing or it's going to update that thing. Um, post is generally reserved for creating a new something. Like I'm going to create a new account and the system is going to generate the identifier. Like it's going to give me back a GUID or some identity value or something like that. Um, and then here you might create like an assignee under a task and then delete. You can kind of do what you want with delete, either delete the entire collection, delete the resource, or a lot of times we kind of mark it as hidden or mark it as complete. You usually don't delete data out of a database, but um, anyway, for, from a HTTP, HTTP perspective, um, delete uh, basically means, as far as the user is concerned, it's going to go away, right? They're not going to see it anymore when they go turn around and call get. So those are kind of the eight methods that you have at your disposal. Really four methods, but across a collection and a single URI. So um, looking at those four methods, um, we want to talk about safety and idem potency before we get into the rest of the, the rest of the rest modeling. Sorry. Um, so safe means that there is no effect at all, no side effects. Nothing, the data is not changing, right? There's no state changing. Idem potent means that I can call as many times as I want. I'm, not, I'm basically not going to get an error. So um, get is safe. Put is idempotent. That means that if I want to update like a task or update an account, and I call put, it should just update it. It shouldn't email. It shouldn't send, send me back a message saying, "Hey, you've already updated it." If it doesn't exist yet, and I call put on it, it should just create it and go away. I shouldn't get an error. Um, same thing with delete. Like if I call delete on a resource that I've already called delete on, big deal. It's already gone, right? I shouldn't get an error back. I shouldn't get something that says throw an exception and say, "Hey, you already deleted it," or it doesn't exist. Try to please don't delete me anymore. Um, it should just delete it and be nice. So that's part of what Roar Fielding wanted, was a nice API. Um, in terms of post, post is neither, right? So post is always going to have some kind of side effect. It's always going to do something. And post is intended to, to create new elements. Like if I post and I want to create an account, it's just going to keep creating a new account every time I call post. Doesn't make any sense. I'm going pretty fast, but OK. <laughs> So again, back to the methods. Like these are the methods we want to use. We we, we want to get away from calling, uh, sorry, uh, creating our own methods on our REST service on our services. So when I create a task, what I should be creating is I should be implementing the POST method itself, and then here I'm, I want to Im implement the PUT method itself. So this isn't this no longer becomes relevant. Like actually, this and this define that endpoint, not the method name. Like no one's ever going to see the method name anymore. That just becomes kind of a, a logical grouping of, of what I'm doing here. The actual service uh, call becomes the URL and the method at that point, which is completely different than SOAP, where a method name, that RPC call itself, is actually very important. OK. So the third thing we want to talk about is kind of discoverability, right? Um, your service itself should be discoverable. Um, it must not require previous knowledge or some kind of contract, as we've, we've kind of talked about already. And it should be hypertext driven. So I think I've got some examples. I will show you some examples of what that looks like. But think of a web page, right? I pull back a web page. We all know what the source on a web page looks like. There's lots of like links, right? A source, A source, all those all over the place. That's kind of what your, your API should look like. When I get back a list of accounts, a list of tasks, a list of people. It should include links on there that allow me to go look at that tasks, you know, users, or look at that accounts, uh, you know, sales orders or whatever. Yeah. So think about an HTML page and how you can get anywhere from from the the root page. So this is what um, uh, hypermedia would look like if you were giving. So this is this is like a response message. If someone said, "Hey, give me give me all your tasks," you would respond with something like this. So you would have like your task ID, maybe a state, and then a bunch of links that say, "Hey, this is." the link that somebody could do a get on to get the, that task's users. This is the link that someone would do a get on to get the history of that task. Um, if they want to do a delete against this URL, 
they're going to mark this task complete. And then an update against that URL uh, would, would come from a put method. So this is sort of similar to a contract or a WSDL, but it's very discoverable because this is going to be returned every time I do something to that, every time I query to get a list of tasks. So the service implementer can change these whenever they want. So your, your app shouldn't bind or bind hard to these things. And we'll talk a minute about collection JSON and how that helps um, discoverability and helps you as a client developer to not bind to uh, specific methods. All right. So, however, the, the end of our uh, modeling here, we went from RPC, where these were our method names, one service endpoint, all post, and we had to know a contract. Now we've kind of evolved, if you will, gone up the maturity model, where now these are relevant, and now I've got uh, URIs or URLs, URIs, HTTP verbs, and using hypermedia, I can kind of navigate through that, that, uh, that model. All right. So one of the problems you'll see is that the responses don't look very self-describing. Like, so even though I'm putting links in there, um, it's kind of hard to understand what to do with that, that API, especially if I'm going to update data, I'm going to create new data. Right? Like if, if, I, if I don't know, uh, if I don't have a contract of what a new account looks like, how am I going to call and create a new account? Like I don't know what data to give you. So it's, it's, it's very, it lends itself very well to gets, where you like just call a URL and you get back a bunch of data. But in terms of like trying to update a task, or update an account, I don't know what to give you, right? As, and I can't have a contract because that, that breaks our REST uh, constraints. So we'll talk in a minute uh, what collection JSON does to address that. All right. So we've kind of gone through what REST is, other than some pictures of kittens. And we've modeled a REST API coming from RPC. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about the web API itself, um, the technology Microsoft put in ASP.NET. Um, so it's not part of WCF, thank God, and it's not part of web forms, and it's not part of MVC. It's, it's a new stack. In fact, it was not even part of the .NET framework originally. It was a separate open source, uh, not open source, but a separate package from Microsoft, and they got absorbed into .NET in, in uh, 2012 or 4.5. So. Um, it supports only HTTP, so unlike WCF, you're not going to use it to do like TCP bindings or name pipes or any, any other kind of communication. It's HTTP only. Um, it's highly convention-based, so for the WCF people in the room, you know that WCF is very, very heavily configuration-based. You got to jump through tons of hoops, and I mean, and you get it wrong, and you're like, oh, and it takes you another three days to figure out what, what thing in the config file got tweaked and why it doesn't work anymore. So WCF is very powerful. I shouldn't knock it that much. It's extremely powerful, and it does what it's supposed to do very well. However, if all you want to do is a REST API on HTTP, it's, it's overkill, and it's hard to do, and there's a lot of junk that gets in the way. A web API is very convention-based. Um, also, you inherit, if you've built a web API um, service, you inherit from API controller versus uh, controller, I think it is, in, WC, uh, in, in MVC. Um, it's easy to incorporate your DI container. Is anybody um, not using dependency injection on services? Oh, and you're in Java. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that, that's what I use, yeah. I use other ones, but I like that the best. Okay, good, I mean, everybody's doing it. So uh, Web API makes it very easy to put in your own DI container. Um, you could do that same thing with MVC, and you could do the same thing with WCF, but it's a little bit harder. Um, they've kind of paved the way for you in Web API, made it very easy. Um, and then there's action filters for pre and post processing. So with WCF, you might use, um, let's get this wrong. Uh, you basically put yourself in the pipeline, the ASP, I'm sorry, the uh, WCF pipeline. Use action filters that are much cleaner, much easier to implement in a web API. And then model binding still works, right? So in MEC, you have model binding, which means that whenever forms are submitted, it automatically is deserialized into your, your objects, your class types. Um, the same thing happens with Web API. It's super simple to get data into a Web API method. Um, and automatically, whenever a client submits an XML, HTTP forms, or JSON, you automatically get hydrated into, into your, your object, including collections, including file uploads. There's a special uh, type, I think it's called, I ah, just, just lost it, file something. I have it in, my, in the source code, I'll show you. Um, that it automatically takes like a multi-part form upload and converts it into a collection of files 
that end up being streams. So it's very, very easy, even, even on a REST API, to get files uploaded to you. Um, and then, um, unlike MVC, where you have to return like an action result or a JSON result or an XML result, uh, your arguments and your return types are always POCO, so there's nothing in the way. Like you look at a, an API controller and it just looks like a normal class. There's no, nothing special about it, no attributes, other than the base, base API controller class, nothing special about it, which is super clean. Um, so, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, it's very convention based. So, you can alter the behavior, but I like to keep it just like this, which is I create a controller and on it I put a get method or a get method with a, with a parameter, a put method with a couple parameters, um, and, that, and that, or it really just works like that. Like you put the route in and it automatically will take 32 and put it in here and then it'll take the, the submitted, like if I'm doing a put, it'll take the body, whether JSON, XML, or forms, and automatically hydrate a task for me. I don't have to do anything. Like there's no mapping anywhere, there's no I serializable or serializable attribute or data contract or data member, all this other kind of junk. It just, just works. And the JSON can be pretty loose even. I mean, if, if, you don't, if the JSON is incomplete, it'll still hydrate as much as it can. And at some point, it'll kind of give up and give you a null. I don't know where that point is. It decides that it doesn't look like a task. Um, but generally speaking, you'll get a task, so. <laughs> um, this is kind of cool, content negotiation, right? Like the client, the caller can, can tell you, hey, I'm gonna speak to you in XML, or I'm gonna speak to you in JSON. And the Web API itself will handle that. Like your code, we'll look at it in a second, is completely unaware that there's even XML or JSON involved. It's just got a class, some methods, and some POCOs, and that's it. Like you have no idea what the actual content is coming in and out of the server. Super nice. And there's actually support for OData. So OData, right, if you know what that is, just a way to query um, an endpoint for like searching, um, you know, filters and, uh, sorry, filters and sorts and groups and that kind of thing. Um, and then with Web API, you can do self-hosting now. Uh, in, in, in 4.5, similar to WCF. So we went through all those things, and I still, it's funny because as I was going through the book, um, or writing the book, doing research for the book, I still found myself asking, well, what is it? Like, if I could point to Web API, like, what would it be? Other than just a bunch of cool features that kind of are in .NET somewhere, right? So I came up with a kind of a long uh, sentence about what, what, Web, what Web, Web, Web API is. So it allows you to build HTTP request activated controllers that through convention support model binding and RESTful design constraints and principles. Bottom line, it's a powerful, it offers powerful support for REST services and it doesn't get in the way. So I mentioned earlier that like, you might go through the book after 120 some pages and be like, is that it? And that's, that's like the beauty of it to me. Like there's really not much to the web API. It's a very simple framework. There's not a lot of ceremony. There's not hardly really any configuration to go through. You can put in your own DI container. You can do any kind of like data access you want, but it really gets out of the way. I mean, it's classic Glenn Block work, right? Like he's the one that worked on the, or in, incepted the web API at, at Microsoft. Um, it really, there really isn't a lot to it. So I hate to kind of like disappoint, but <laughs> if you read the book or you get done researching, you're like, really, is that all? Like, that's perfect. Like, that's what you want to walk away with. Don't let that diminish the power of it though. Like it lets you get to writing your services quickly without getting tripped over uh, configuration and all the other bindings and junk that usually go with writing services. So while a WCF book, you might find one that's like 600 pages long. I, I can't imagine you're ever gonna find a web API book that's 600 pages long. Or they're just blowing a bunch of junk in there because there's really not much to it. Um, in fact, one of the books coming out from Glenn Block about web API is mostly theory. Right, I've read some of it, it's mostly theory about REST and APIs in general and versioning, and it's all good stuff. Still not a lot of web API, because there's not much to it, so. All right, versus WCF. I wanna cover this real quickly. Um, convention over configuration, we talked about that already. Uh, REST API is very much convention based. You follow the rules, which are pretty easy, and it just works. You don't have to do anything configuration wise. In fact, I think when I was writing my services, I, didn't, I don't think I put anything other than like log for net and then hibernate in the config file. So it just, just worked right out of the box. Um, HTTP only, so you're not gonna do TCP or name pipes. Um, the pipeline model is very much simpler. So it's easy to put in action, like post and pre and post uh, filters on your method calls. And the focus, of course, was why I'm here, is on being RESTful. Unlike WCF, sorry, REST on WCF, which is kind of restful, but kind of not. In fact, I heard Glenn Block one time even admit that they goofed up, that that was a mistake. So <laughs> if you're doing REST on WCF, I urge you to stop it and use Web API instead. 
Um, and again, um, unlike WCF, which is more SOAP based, it encourages client server decoupling as opposed to coupling, um, which is wonderful when you're talking about like mobile apps talking to your, to your site, or you're talking about like uh, HTML pages and JavaScript and Ajax calls, and it's, it's an incredibly decoupling architecture. All right, let's just look at some code now. You know what? I never started this thing. Is it, did someone start that for me? Okay. <laughs> do I have to go back and do it all over again? Or? Okay. <clears throat> I should have had this loaded. So what time we have? So I'll, I'll just spend about five, five, maybe five, seven, eight minutes going through some of the code. Um, this is all out on a, uh, a GitHub repository under my name. So you can, you can download it and look at it yourself. But we'll just kind of quickly go through the, uh, the couple of the um, uh, controllers. Because I do want to talk about uh, database, how to manage a database session. I think that's incredibly important. All right, so this is the, um, let me make sure I zoom in when I need to. So this is the, uh, the solution that I have out on GitHub that goes with the book. So as I, as I go through the book and um, kind of build the solution, this is, this, is what you'll, you'll run in, this is what you'll end up with out there. Plus some bug fixes that people are letting me know about. So the controllers, again, if you're used to MVC, you, 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 know, the, you know the idea of a controller. Um, so let's look at a simple one here, category controller. Let's see. Zoom. So as I mentioned, um, you, imp you uh, implement an API controller. And real simply, you, um, after you plug in the DI bit, which I'll show you how to do, you have your dependencies injected. And then you write get methods, post methods, <laughs> and delete methods. I don't think I have a put on this one. Oh, there's a put. That, that's it, right? I mean, there's, <laughs> there's really nothing to it. Um, there's a lot of plumbing that goes in place to get like the DI plugged in. And I, I'm using it in Hibernate in this case, so I'm managing the database session with an action filter. I'll show you that. But the service itself is like super simple. And there, there isn't any configuration in the, web, in, the, in the web config that allows this to happen. Um, you can make a, a super simple, when you create a new project, create a new MVC4 project and you can pick Web API, it kind of stubs out a, uh, a kind of a sample controller. That's really all you need. So, um, yeah, there's not, not much more to it. Come again. Yes. Yeah, we'll I'll talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, well, any questions on this? <laughs> we'll talk about the, uh, the, the session management. We'll talk about this attribute here in a minute. Um, any specific questions on like the API controller? Uh, you already asked one, but I mean, it's pretty simple. Yay, no questions. Um, I've I thought about it. I mean, yeah. yeah. I know I've seen people do options to help like query the service and figure out what's allowed. Yeah. I mean, these are, these are the, the four primary ones that tend to get implemented. Um, all right, so let's fire it up and uh, we'll call just a simple controller here. And I don't have time to go through all the controllers and the whole model, but um, you kind of get the idea. So let's, uh, let's see. So I like to use, um, the uh, advanced REST client. It's a Chrome plugin. Hey, look, it's already there. Yeah, I've already, I'll, I'll cover security in a minute, but I've already got my uh, basic authentication uh, token in there. Hope this works. Yay. So, can you see this? Yeah. So I've basically said, give me all the categories, right? And what I get back is a list of my categories. And if I wanted to, again, this goes back to the hypermedia. If I wanted to, to get just this next act, this red category, all I'd have to do is, it tells me, all I have to do is slap a one onto the URL. To get that one category. 
so pretty simple, right? And if, let's say if I wanted to um, get XML instead, let's do this. Can change the accept or the content type header. Oops. Now it's XML. So going back to my code, like there's nothing in here about XML. It doesn't it doesn't know what I'm doing in terms of XML or JSON or, or uh, forms. And if I if I would paste in a new category, uh, let's try it real quick. This probably isn't going to work, but. Dangerous to try things on a, uh, on a demo. So let's grab some. Uh, so let's say we go back to here, change this to uh, post. Mark. Huh. Let's see, what's the, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna get it right. Anyway, in theory, that's what you would do, right? So you would, you would just post your data here. And I'm sure I've got a syntax error somewhere doing something. Does anybody know the accept, the content type for uh, JSON? I think that's it. That's what I thought, yeah. You know what? Let's change this to content type. Yay. Okay. The details. Okay, so what it's giving me back is an HTTP response saying, hey, 201, which is HTTP response code for, hey, I created something. And in the response header, what it gives you back somewhere, yeah, location is the, you can't see that from there probably, but it basically says API categories four, right? So that's my new, uh, that's my new category that it just created. So now I can tr turn around and do a get on four, and then get back my new mark category. Like, so that's my API, no SOAP. No contract. I just like toss some text at it and I get a new category. And that's really all there is to a web API or a REST, um, a REST service. Very clean and um, very easy to do from, from uh, JavaScript with AJAX calls or jQuery. All right. All right I'm going to jump back to the uh, PowerPoint here. I've only got another 15, 20 minutes. Oops. Let's go to my PowerPoint. All right, so you, you um, asked about iSession. Um, you, you can do, obviously, you can use any kind of database, uh, ORM, or any kind of data access you want. I like to use N-Hibernate versus Entity Framework personally, but any framework will work fine as well. Um, but the thing to remember when you're building these services is you need to ensure that there's a single active session for the entire request. So think of this as an incoming request comes into your server, right? So somebody, whether it's my active REST client or advanced REST client in my browser, or it's an AJAX call from a web application or a mobile client is calling it, there's an incoming request, right? It's saying, get me some data, get me those tasks. Um, so ASP.NET is gonna activate your controller and it's gonna resolve all your dependencies. So going back to my code, I had like three dependencies, I think, on my controller. So it's gonna do that for me. The next thing it's gonna do is it's gonna call my action filter, and I'll show you that in a second. And in my action filter, I'm gonna use a session factory and I'm gonna open up a connection I'm going to start a transaction. And then basically I, I uh, uh, yeah. I basically stuff that, that uh, session, or if it was any framework, it'd be like a data context or object context. I actually stuff that in, in my container with a lifetime management of per call. So does that make any sense? You know what I'm talking about with like Ninject or, uh, okay, so I'm basically saying um, open a connection and stick it back in the container. In this case, it's an hibernate uh, I session instance. Then when my uh, controller is resolved, it's gonna put that iSession dependency, it's gonna inject, yes? Um, um, Turn it on. Yeah. <laughs> if you're doing caching though, 
right now is you're doing per request. So it builds up, tears down, builds up, tears down. Each request is consistent. But now if you're doing caching, if you want to keep it between requests, how would you do this in the same form? Or is that one you want to talk about later? I'm not going to talk about it in the next 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> well, what what would you do? Then after the fact, then can we talk about that? Because sure, that's sure. actually something we're putting into a framework right now. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about with uh, Hibernate or are you talking about data caching or are you talking about higher up? Uh, we're actually talking about higher up and then being able to, to encapsulate that, but it's actually going to be using Entity as a, as a backend store. Yeah, okay. Entity framework? Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's data caching at the database level and there's caching at the HTTP level, which is completely different anyway, so. Yeah, and this would be HTTP oh, okay. level caching. So that wouldn't be dependent on how we're doing our data access um, because that would be cached by like your, your router or your load balancer or whatever, I guess. So, okay. Um, anything that the controller is going to use via, de via dependency injection is also going to get that same I session. So like my controller itself is going gonna, is gonna, to like delegate off to like a repository or some other class to go get a bunch of data or update data. Anything in that call chain is going to get that instance of I session that I already opened up. All right, and then once all that work is done, I've saved data or, or I've retrieved data, the kind of the post method of the action filter is going to be called, at which point I do a commit or rollback if there's an error, and I close that connection. So the key is that the controller simply has the session injected and everything else down that, down that call stack. Right? So my controller doesn't start a new session. My controller doesn't open a connection. It doesn't really know anything about it other than it gets an I session. I could inject it even more and I could have injected like a repository, in which case it would know hardly anything about the database at all. I took a simple route and I, I'm actually injecting an I session, but you wouldn't have to. Um, so that's pretty key. I see a lot of people making mistakes where their controller is starting a transaction and they're like trying to pass it around and they're trying to use like, um, like uh, distributed transactions to try to stitch them together. It just gets kind of messy. The, the trick is you want to start your, your, you wanna start your uh, connection, like if it's an object context or an I session or whatever, in one of those filters. I got cut off. So again, the controller itself doesn't, mash, doesn't manage the session lifetime, the state, or the transactions. You want somebody else to handle that for you. Of course, that's your code, but anyway, the, from the controller's viewpoint, the controller itself shouldn't manage the lifetime. So let's look at an example of that. Mm -hmm. So what you notice, um, I have this uh, attribute here. That's my logging in Hibernate session. And what it does is, uh, Starts the, so that was, there's the uh, on, on action executing. Let me zoom that in, sorry. So when ASP.NET fires out my controller, it goes into this action filter, because this, this guy derives from uh, action filter attribute. And he's gonna begin a transaction. I happen to have uh, a helper class in there that goes out and uses the session factory and starts up a new session and, and sticks, it in the, sticks it in the container. Um, but if you're using any framework, you could just new up a new object context, stick it in the container or whatever. And that allows you then, at the point at which um, the controller itself is, the dependencies are resolved, um, it gets injected in there. And then on the way out, uh, we're gonna end our transaction and we're gonna close the connection, or in, in Hibernate, it's close the session. So again, this is kind of pre, and this is post. I don't know why they didn't call it pre and post, but anyway, pre and post. And this is where you can then handle exceptions. You can log the fact that you're entering and exiting. I like to do that for debugging purposes. So I look at my logs and I see like starting, begin transaction, bunch of stuff, ending, maybe an exception, and then, and then a, a close or a, an exit. So any questions on the, um, I kind of fuzzed over the details there, but <laughs> you can look at the code. Um, any questions on uh, like managing the session or the transaction within Hibernate or w w with regards to Web API? Any uh, counter arguments for how you might do it today? Or good. Either I'm right or everybody's asleep. I don't know which. <laughs> Are we out questions and answers yet, or do we wait at the end? Do you normally? It doesn't matter to me. Whatever protocol is. Um, one question I had was you talked about the put, yeah. always being able to, uh, what would you call it, idempotent or something? Idempotent, yeah. Yeah, so that one is, right? Yes, yes. put is. Um, 
and that one's doing an upsert, right? Yes. So I guess I was curious, how, how does that work? How can you get, uh, again, the code? Possible? Well, how could you guarantee that, that it is if someone hands you like a bag of bad stuff or something? Um, that doesn't mean you can't generate an error. It just means that the, the act of putting shouldn't like call it, like it shouldn't create a new thing. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So, so if okay. I put Maybe an account, I shouldn't get like account, a new account, new account, new account. If the account didn't exist, it should create a new one. If it already exists, it should do an update. Okay. If, it, okay. if it's bad data, then that's bad data, yeah. Okay, I didn't understand yeah. that. So, yeah, I didn't mean to say that you shouldn't ever have any errors. Okay. Yeah. And then I had one other question, but I think I forgot it, so <laughs> see if I can remember it later. Um, one of the things I didn't mention was um, the use of HTTP response codes. So one of the things I've got in my, uh, these fetchers here, because I like to do a lot of abstraction, is if, it's, if something is not found, let me zoom in again, it return, um, set, bleh, return not found, which is a 404, right? So one of the nice things about REST, and I, I gave this same talk a couple weeks ago at a, at a client over a, a lunch, one of the nice things about uh, REST is that, again, it's an agreed upon contract, like universal contract. There's only four or five methods, and the response codes are all pretty much the same, right? There's 400, 401, 404, 403, 500, 201, 2, you know, those are, those are common, right? They're all, they're all the same. So when you're developing a SOAP service, and you say, hey, I gotta give a response back, when they, when they say, you know, give me a category that doesn't exist. I can give back a null, I can give back some empty thing, I can give back, I can throw an exception. Those are kind of your decisions to make as a, when you're writing a SOAP service. When you're writing a REST service, there's only one answer, it's a 404, right? So browsers know what a 404 is, every developer out there doing web programming knows what a 404 is. So it's pretty simple. So it, it, it gets you quickly out of the conversations about, well, how are we gonna return? We return a null, do we return an exception? You know, do we gotta invent a bunch of like IDs and status codes? I mean, if you've ever done a SOAP service, you've done that, right? You come up with a list of categories and IDs. Like, you don't need to do that because there are already codes out there called HTTP response codes. And that's what you use. And you can stick some more information there, and, and I do that. So that tells the caller, like, oh, well, what's not found? And maybe some more specific data. But in general, a 404 is a 404. That means whatever they asked for isn't there, right? So it kind of, again, it jumps over a bunch of useless conversations and gets you right to the, the HTTP protocol. It allows you to leverage things that people have already invented instead of inventing a new protocol on your own. So. About what? Correct. Yeah, I mean, it's just something you're sticking, like you can return like a byte array. You can return the response itself. No? Yeah, I just changed the content type. Yeah. All right. Continuing on, what time is it? Do we need to cut off at uh, eight, right? Ish? Nine, 10? <laughs> okay. I'll talk faster. Okay, so security is very important. And nobody understands it, and everybody gets it wrong. So I'm just gonna try to be as simple as I possibly can and know that there's a lot to do with security if you want. And I've done a lot of stuff. There's tons of books on it. Um, I think Mark, you and I were talking about Think Texture. Dominic Baer, I've talked with him myself. Like I, I, there's a lot you can do, but I want to kind of cut down to like some basics. Just say like a foothold. Because if you go Google Web API security, you're going to be like, like all over the place. So um, I suggest you try this before you go more advanced. So just use HTTP security. Right Back to the REST idea in the first place, we're going to leverage what's already there. And HTTP already has security. Well, there's none. And there's basic security. There's digest security, Kerberos certificates and tokens. Like those are all already part of and have been for a long time part of the HTTP uh, protocol. So use them. Um, what you're not gonna get, at least right now, is some WS star. So does anybody know like federated um, authentication or WS trust, WS security? I think Mark, you were gonna talk about it a little bit as in our little pre-interview there. You're not gonna get that right now. Now Dominic Bear and the Think Texture crowd is working on um, some WS star type things for web, web API, but they're not there yet. In fact, I was, just last week, I was trying to plug some of that stuff into web API and it was kind of dodgy and wasn't quite all there. And he, he, I mean, it's, it's open source. I mean, every day he's plugging in new code, trying to get stuff working. So I would say just kind of skip that for now and just go with something that's really basic. And, and the, key, the key to security, in, in my mind, we're talking about a web API like this, is to remember that it's stateless. Like, 
anything security related must be recluded, included in your request message. There's nothing magical about it, right? Like if I give you a username and password, it has to be in there somewhere. If it's stateless and it's over HTTP, it's gotta be there. <laughs> it can't be on some back channel. It can't be like via telepathy. I can't email you something. Like it's gotta be in that request message. And if you remember that, then all of a sudden it's like a whole lot easier. Like I've gone to the, sometimes I'll, I'll implement security by just sticking like a token, flat out token like an authorization header and say, hey, here you go. And the server can take it and they can run with it. Like that's security kind of, right? It just tells you who I am. And you add a password in there and now I've got, now I've got verification of, of my claimed identity. So, but that just goes in the authorization header. You don't have to put that in the message itself. It shouldn't go in your JSON. If you have JSON that's got like username and password in it, stop it. There's a place in the HTTP header for that. In fact, browsers love it. So if I go back to my, um, oh, sorry. If I go back to my example here, and then I've implemented basic, I'm gonna open up a new uh, browser so I don't, anything's cached. Come on. So the fact that I've implemented basic security, even the browser recognizes it. So I can just type in my username and password <laughs> and get the password wrong. Somebody know what it is? Son of a... <laughs> now I'm going to get locked out. What is it? I don't think it's password. Let's see. That would be funny. That's what I typed. Let's try it again. J Bob, J Bob, one, two, three, four, five. Hey! Okay. What was that? So that's also best practice, right? Your password findable. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually did that because somebody um, filed an issue and said, hey, what's the password? And I'm like, it's right there. Come on. <laughs> No, so I just stuck that in there. Um, let's see. So, funny thing is, if I look at the, uh, oh, I love this part. If I look at the network call with the Chrome tools, guess what I see in the header? Right there. That's all I have to do, right? Like that's, that's exactly what I put in. Sorry, can you see that? Basic authentication with my username and password, base64 encoded. That's all it is. I talk about that in the book. It's in the source code that goes with the book. That's all this is too, right? Like I'm doing security just by sticking basic and a username and password, base64 encoded in there. Yes? I don't know if you were, you were going to get to this, <clears throat> but if you're, if you're sticking stuff in the authorization header, you can't do this over plain HTTP, right? I mean, you have to use HTTPS. Base64 encoding is not really enough to secure. Well, it's not encrypted at all, because I can right. just... Yeah. Unbase 64 it. Right. Correct. So you have to do HTTPS. Well, you didn't mention that yet, so I, was, Sorry. I wasn't sure if you were going to get to that or not. Yeah. I'm not here, but yeah. That, that's generally what I do for writing um, like mobile client services. And there's OAuth, there's OpenID, there's Digest, there's tokens, there's certificates. There's an array of things you can get into. Bottom line, it all has to be shipped over that HTTP request, though. So even if I were going to stick a nice fat certificate in there, like if it's, not HTTP, if it's not SSL, I can just grab it and use it again. So you're, you're going to do SSL no matter what. Unless you're doing like one, you know, per call authentication. And even that someone could, could grab, right? So you have to do HTTPS if you're going over HTTP. Once you have the thing secured with SSL, you can put whatever you want in there. I mean, I could, if I want, I could just, this isn't any better than plain text. As you're pointing out, it's not, it's not actually encrypted. It's just basic, I don't even know why they do by 64. I suppose it's obfuscated for the web and people that invented the web, you know, 30 years ago, but it, it's not encrypted at all, right? Um, what was I gonna say? Yeah, so I, I have actually implemented security by doing my own, not basic, I'll do my own, and then I'll just say, hey, just jam your username and password in there. But, I mean, once, I, once I'm on SSL, the thing's, the thing's protected anyway. Now, I don't mean to say that there's not more to security, and if you're writing a banking application, like, definitely go the next step. There are ways to make it more secure. But for the average application, especially if you're like on an intranet or you're writing like a mobile app, you know, just doing some 
kind of game plan or whatever, like this is this is enough, and it's easy to do. I have the code in there, like the the code to um, here I'll show you real quick. The code to do base64 encoding, if you don't know how, has two lines. So this is all I'm doing to put that header in there. The um, HTTP says that if you're doing basic authentication, you do the username, colon, password, convert it to base64, stick basic in front of it, there you're doing basic authentication. So on the server, I just kind of undo all that. And the nice thing is, uh, from a server perspective, Again, I'm going really fast through all this code. I, you need to go download it if you want to look at the details. But Oops, sorry. Hang on. I had to go find my uh, provider. There it is. There's the message handle, handler. So this is all we're doing on the other end. You know, getting back to what you just said about it only being base64. I just reverse it, split it out. I mean, this is this is super basic stuff. And I don't know why this isn't available. Like this is where I talked about. I downloaded the Dominic Byers uh, Think Texture library for doing basic authentication. It just didn't work. I don't know. I got just stopped just short of debugging his code to figure out why it wasn't working. And I, again, he's still working on it. That's all there really is available. But if you want. To do basic authentication in Web API, go grab this code and plug it in. It works. And there's nothing more to it. Like, I hate to burst your bubble, but doing security over HTTP is pretty easy to do with the basics. So what was the first part of that? Um, so what I've done, you're talking about like forms authentication? I mean forms authentication just puts a ticket in the authorization header. So then on the server side, what you can do, and I've done this before, is you, uh, I don't think I have the code here, maybe we'll follow up later, but you basically take the forms authentication library and you say, oh, what is it, you take the, the token and you convert it into a principle. Because forms authentication just puts that token right in the, uh, in the authorization header. Again, it has to, right, there's an HTTP request. It's got to be in there somewhere. And all you got to do is grab it out of the header and then use the forms authentication library to convert it into a principle. So yeah, if so, basically what he's getting at is, let's say I have a forms authenticated application. And so they go into it with their browser, they sign on, they're in the app. At that point, I've got the token that expires in 20 minutes or whatever it is in my authorization header. You can grab it. And you can convert it into who, and you can know who they are at that point. Yes. Okay, um, you had mentioned earlier about, I, I like the fact that whether it's XML or JSON or whatever, that you don't care, that acts kind of just, it just <laughs> works. That's really nice. Yep. Um, the part that kind of lost me a little bit was this idea that the person who publishes a service can just kind of change their mind and it's discoverable. And, and I get how that would work if it was me browsing the web, a human. Um, where I'm struggling to understand that is, I, you know, normally when we write these services and we're doing machine to machine talking and stuff, I, I mean, we... Code's not going to adapt, right? Well, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. You're obviously, you don't expect me to be able to write Some code. Some damn smart to code. Parse that and write and go, oh, okay, I guess I need to do this now. So I guess, doesn't that mean that there's got to be guidelines for versioning and all this other stuff? Or, or could you talk a little bit about that problem, whether it is a problem and how? Yeah, in fact, that's a good segue into uh, collection JSON. We looked at security. Um, and then that'll be it. So... Um, so I do want to say that this is the same problem I'm struggling with right now, and I'm having dialogues with the guys that work for me, and there's not like a good clean answer. Because remember, the REST wasn't just for web APIs. It was also for like all of the web. But if you try and apply it to an API, you're kind of having that discussion in your head, like, wait a minute, I have to code something that isn't, the code's not going to change just as the service uh, changes. But what you can do, so let's talk about this, and then maybe that will kind of address what you're getting at. Because part of the collection JSON um, uh, specification is, is to try to let your UI and your code adopt as best it can. So you, you sort of, okay, let's just talk about it. <laughs> so um, the resp going back to the problems, the responses weren't very self-describing, and they were missing the things that would allow me to adopt, uh, my code to adopt or adapt to changing specification. So 
Um, collection JSON is an approved media type now. It's a, kind of a pseudo media type, I guess. Um, and it describes collections and links. And it formalizes things like the data themselves, the links, queries, errors, and uh, update templates or write templates. So it tells me, it, allow, it puts data in the response to allow my code to dynamically generate the data or generate like web pages themselves if I'm querying for input. So, uh, yes, smiley face. To my, in my mind, collection JSON is what we really need to make hypermedia, which is kind of this uh, no contract discoverability aspect of REST, make that much more tangible. Because before you have collection JSON, you had that same question like, well, I'm not really browsing my API, I'm coding against it, and then the user is gonna use my application. So the following was taken from um, uh, Mike, uh, what's his name, Amundsen. Uh, he's the guy that came up with the media type. He's got a nice book out there on REST. Um, I haven't found a good library that I like for collection JSON and web, web API, so you kind of have to either roll your own or Glenblock's got kind of a half-assed library you can use. Um, sorry, Glenn. <laughs> um, so if we look at this, um, we're basically saying <laughs> we start with uh, root collection and then we list the links. So these are the things that I can turn around and do with uh, this particular collection. And what's important here is you get down to the items themselves. So what, what's this thing getting? I'm getting a list of friends. And the data items themselves, like here's full name, Here's a prompt. So the prompt is what you're supposed to show like in a label or a button or something like that. So that is, I mean, it's kind of a sucky answer, but that's kind of what the idea is behind collection JSON is it allows you to um, dynamically generate, like, it, okay, we'll get to the right part in a minute, but it allows you to dynamically generate like your URI. So let's say I was just gonna bind with a client library. I was just gonna like loop through these items. Here's my label. Here's the data I'm gonna show in it. Here's what I call maybe my, my ID for my, uh, my element in, in HTML, right? So in that sense, it's pretty dynamic. Now if I had to code against it, if I said, hey, go get, that, go get the email, I'd have to know that that's gonna be an email. At that point, I'm doing some bit of coupling. I guess I could get a little more dynamic and say, hey, is there an email? If not, blah, blah, blah. But essentially, that's really all you have for allowing your code to be more adaptable. Then you get to the right part. Okay, I'll do the queries first. So the queries allows me to specify when I do a search, so kind of broken up, but here's my prompt. So I might put a search button that calls this URL and submits this data. They're only, they've only got one value here, of course, but I could submit more than one thing in my form. So that's telling me how do I query that service to go find friends in this case. So that allows me, again, for my code to be a little more adaptable because this, this, this spec is telling me how to interact with that service. And then the, on the right templates, this is probably the most important part. What this is allowing me to do is say, if I want to create a friend, here's what I have to have. I have to have a full name, an email, a blog, and an avatar. And here's what I might actually put on the label on the screen for those things. And they're all strings, right? There's no data type in there. This isn't SOAP. There's really no validation. I mean, there's no data type in JSON, right? So all I have to do, if I want to prompt the user to create a friend, is just loop through this and stick some labels and text boxes on the screen with a submit button. If it was that simple, couldn't you just write one generic term in your UI? Like, why would you need more than one UI? I guess just stop for the style. Yeah, that's, that's going to be my answer. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't want to use your app, but if you did that, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you can narrow it a little bit and say, hey, this is how we interact with friends but I'm gonna allow my friends API to add and remove uh, details here. But I'm still gonna have a page that is just for friends. So it's kind of in between, right? I'm not gonna make one grand app to do all of the web, but I'm also not gonna code directly to having four values there. I'm gonna say, okay, there's gonna be a list of values and I'm gonna bind to those whatever they, whatever they might be on the friends page. So I know, again, I don't think that's a great answer. I don't, I don't think there's a good answer out there for what you're asking. That's about as best as we can get at this point. Um, I think JSON itself lends itself to be a little less coupling because you don't have all the specification, the data types, all the validations, so that helps. Um, this helps a little bit. Um, so those things kind of contribute to being a little uh, less coupled. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah.
when sending data to the server, client should fill in the template and use post or put uh, to create a new item. We just, we just talked about that. All right, so that's pretty much it. I'm actually over time. I do want to talk about real quick some things I'm working on the pipeline, in case you're interested. Right now I'm writing a, with a friend of mine, our coworker, Drupal as an enterprise development platform. You're probably asking, why is this guy writing a book about Drupal when he's doing Web API? But um, I'm a solution guy, and I like to pick the right tools for the job, and I found in my consulting work that sometimes I don't want to write code from scratch. Right? So there's this belief that says, let's start with an enterprise like development platform that already does REST services, it already does authentication, it already does styling, it already does like content management. And let's put things on top of that. And we're cutting like tons of time off of our projects by doing that. So instead of saying, hey, I'm gonna start with modeling a SQL Server database, and I'm gonna put in a log for net library, and then I'm gonna add in an inject, which are all fun things to do and very appropriate at times. Sometimes we wanna quickly spin up a website and you can just turn things on with something like Drupal or I wouldn't say SharePoint, but there's other, other CMSs out there that are powerful like Drupal. So. Um, something else uh, that I'll be working on pretty soon, they're trying to, APRESS is pushing me on, is a PowerShell book. Do you guys like PowerShell? Use PowerShell? Anybody? Awesome. I love PowerShell. <laughs> it's fun. I'll put that in the book. It's fun. Um, and then over the course of this coming year, I'm going to work on some articles to kind of follow up on the web API. Um, and then they want to turn that into a second edition. So there's some extra junk I want to remove out of the book. Um, I'd, like, I'd love to, to talk about Web API on top of a NoSQL database. I was going to do it um, for this demo, but it was too different from the code in there, and I didn't want to go joking it up before I jumped into here and started talking about it. So, but there will be a follow-on article, and then it'll show up in a book of how to, how to do Web API with like Cassandra, which is totally awesome. We're doing some projects right now with Cassandra. Um, Entity Framework, as these security options get developed, um, I'd like to start including them in um, some articles and in the source code that goes with the book. Um, right now, they're kind of, again, kind of dodgy. They're, they're not really all there yet. Um, collection JSON, OData is doing pretty well. And then, of course, how to build package and deploy a web API. I'm a big fan of um, continuous deployment, continuous delivery. Uh, Jez Humble, a uh, great book on continuous delivery. Um, and I think you can apply that to web API. So I'd like to see some content on that. Uh, that's it. So here's my site. Uh, the source code I talked about and Twitter handle. So there you go. Any questions? Thanks.